at the beginning, to be honest, for me, it also looked a bit like a Ponzi scheme. So there was actually no lawyer involved and was really purely on chain. So maybe one of the reasons why obviously Satoshi did this as kind of first principle, no one knows me, I'm not here. If the founders would disappear or the core team behind it, would anyone jump in and be able to fix it? It's really difficult to actually take those chain down. Like it will not be easily possible. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. So today we have Gnosis Chain, so the third most decentralized uh, chain in the world after Bitcoin and Ethereum. Almost $300 million uh, in uh, market cap, correct? And almost $1 billion at the top when it was uh, in 2021. So tell me about yourself a little bit. Um, I know that you entered the blockchain space like right away, like you just started your career like right away from the blockchain space. So tell me, why blockchain? How has it happened? And a uh, little bit of your own background. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, Violetta. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Like I, I started working on blockchain related projects right after uh, I finished university. So I did a master's degree in computer science. And uh, yeah, at the same time, almost, um, yeah, we discovered the Bitcoin white paper and it was very early. It was 2000, uh, I think 2013. So at that time there was hardly any adoption of, of Bitcoin, obviously, and there was very few applications taking advantage of it. And, uh, Given that we had a computer science background, we knew how to develop applications and we were thinking about how we could yeah, build applications that can give Bitcoin more utility because obviously Bitcoin itself only allows you to send Bitcoin from one address to another. So there's nothing really sophisticated. And so, yeah, we we're thinking about applications, start building the first applications um, while we we're still uh, finishing our master's degree, me and Martin, my co-founder. And um, so, yeah, it was, we, we kind of saw the p potential of Bitcoin <laughs> at the beginning, to be honest, for me, it also looked a bit like a Ponzi scheme, uh, given how the, how Bitcoin was structured, but, um, it was obviously super early and was interesting to just explore. Okay. What can we do? And we saw the potential of finally having something where, um, yeah, you can have a payment system where, yeah, it's truly peer to peer, something that just didn't exist beforehand. And um, yeah, so we started tempering around with Bitcoin and yeah, built the first applications. And then we also discovered... So, so you met yeah. in university with your co-founder? That's right. Yeah, we started together, same project during our masters. And uh, so we did actually a couple of different things together before we started working on Bitcoin. Um, but Bitcoin is what actually then took off, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, and how how did you came to Gnosis? So how is it uh, the concept right. even like begin? Yeah, and like what we initially tried with Bitcoin was also building a prediction market. But again, Bitcoin is so limited in the functionality that it still had lots of like centralized components, which really didn't allow the concept to be um, yeah kind of what you would like to have in this centralized application. And then we discovered Ethereum also very early on, two thousand fourteen. Um, we understood the concept of smart contracts and we understood that what we built previously on Bitcoin, now we could build much more decentralized on Ethereum. And we were very early also in contact with the founders of Ethereum and especially with Joe Lubin, who created Consensus at the time. And yeah, we pitched the idea to him and he was, uh, yeah, he really saw the potential and he convinced us to join Consensus. So we were very early on, like uh, employee number three and four. <laughs> And consensus and uh, started building Gnosis as part of consensus. Um, but there was already very initially the goal also to, to finally do a spin off from consensus. So even though it was integrated within consensus, it was always clear um, the goal is to, to lead Gnosis out, outside of consensus to do a spin off. And that's what happened in 2017. Uh, we did one of the first ICOs on Ethereum. And um, yeah, we raised capital, we became independent from consensus and with this capital we could build all kinds of things. So not only prediction markets, but then we also ventured into uh, yeah, multi-signature wallets, decentralized exchanges and um, did a bunch of things. <laughs> so at the yeah. time, like there was nothing. It's like the internet 
in 1990 maybe where there's hardly any infrastructure so if you want to do something you first of all have to build a lot of the core infrastructure to even get to this point where you can build real applications yeah tell a little bit more about uh, your pivoting because yeah you started like with uh, prediction markets and then how did it happen that i know that you passed the merger as well right so one actually two more, but we will talk about the first one first uh so tell us about this transition this pass right yes so Basically, as I mentioned, we did the ICO, one of the first ICOs. And if you receive funding, you have to store the funding somewhere, right? And at that time, there was no, simply no solution available to store the ERC-20 tokens um, in a safe way. And so we implemented the first multi-signature wallet allowing to store ERC-20 tokens. And uh, obviously, there were a lot of ICOs happening at the time, and they all used our solution because it was the only solution. And it was uh, reasonably well engineered, so there was no need for you to create something else. And uh, so we had kind of the combination of being an early mover in the space, plus reasonably good engineering, which made it yeah, not needed to create anything else. And so it became the most widely adopted multi-signature wallet at the time. And uh, so it kind of it was not by accident, but it was not really the intention to build like a great big multi-signature wallet was just something that just uh, happened because we needed it ourselves necessity out of necessity <laughs> exactly and, and even like the exchanges also um obviously the focus was prediction markets so um for prediction markets obviously you need market mechanisms to be able to exchange tokens and at the time there was also no market mechanism available to effectively do this and so we started implementing the first yeah, decentralized exchanges so one of our engineers came up with a formula that ultimately turned into Uniswap. We implemented it also ourselves, but we never really put a lot of focus on it. Um, mm -hmm. But we did a lot of research in terms of how to build fair decentralized exchanges, which is obviously very difficult. And we know now the topic of MEV, um, maximum extractable value. That's something even before the term was, uh, was kind of coined. We were already aware of those issues, and so we very early on started building mechanisms that would combat those uh, flaws. And the result of this was CowSwap, um, coincidence of wants. Uh, that is an exchange that tries to prevent like the, the issues that come from decentralized uh, trading, such as MEV, and is now also one of the largest DEX aggregators available today. Yeah, and tell a little bit about the merge uh, with XDAI. And that was an interesting one. So um, last, actually the year before, I think in 2022 or 2021, I'll wait, forget. But uh, we, uh, yeah, so we, we decided that uh, the two main products that we built, the SAFE, the SAFE is the successor of the Gnosis Multisig, uh, as well as, as CowSwap would become independent of Gnosis. So we were lucky to have um, very strong employees in Gnosis, which were, I would say had the qualities of becoming founders and also demanded responsibility um, and they did very well so even before those spin-offs became real like they actually like operated quite independently even already with the gnosis for some time so there was confidence that those people could lead uh yeah lead those projects also outside of gnosis independently and at the same time, we saw the potential um, to grow those projects faster and by uh, accelerating hiring and just making, giving people even more responsibility by just becoming founders, uh, as well as the opportunity to raise capital because we were still in the bull market. Um, there was like obvious product market fit for both, for the safe anyways, and for Cowsho as well. And so it was pretty clear, like it would be much easier actually to raise capital for those specific projects than for Gnosis. Even though everything was part of Gnosis, it was not really clear, like how would, uh, how would those projects relate to the Gno token? And so it was more straightforward to actually make some spin-offs, <laughs> let them issue their own token, raise their own capital, and then give part of the tokens um, of those projects back to Gno token holders uh, mm -hmm. by giving them to Gnosis DAO that's what happened so and then obviously the question is like what does Gnosis actually do right like basically everyone left the company uh, and there's only a core team um, core team left at the same time obviously we have been building a lot of infrastructure we have been building a lot of depths actually and uh, we also already at that time um, we were operating or like 
implementing the second largest Ethereum client, Open Ethereum, which we eventually discontinued, but at the time it was. Um, and so we had lots of expertise in both the core development, but also application development. And uh, yeah, so we saw the potential to even run our own network. And uh, even before the merge with Ecta happened, like in the year earlier, we were looking at different solutions to scale our applications because it was already becoming obvious to us that Ethereum fees would skyrocket and would be impossible to run most of the applications on Ethereum. So we looked for cheaper alternatives. And we talked to everyone like Optimism, Polygon at that time was still called Matic and, uh, and others. And um, XDAI was at that time the only viable path for immediate uh, scalability. So it was a functioning network, the oldest sidechain to Ethereum and uh, it had very low cost for us to operate applications and so we decided to already join forces, deploy all the applications there and try to help bootstrap the, the ecosystem. And so because of that, when we were thinking about how could we actually run our own network, um, the most obvious answer was, okay, let's try to collaborate with XDAI because it's already an existing mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, building everything from scratch is a lot of work. So it's easier to just uh, piggyback on an existing network. And so we discussed with the XDAI community and um, I think for both sides, we saw all the potential synergies. And so yeah, we, we effectively ultimately did an offer to both DAOs, to the Gnosis DAO, but also the stake token holders and to do a merge of tokens. Um, so there was actually no lawyer involved and was really purely on chain where uh, stake token holders, the token of XDAI, could be swapped at a fixed rate to GNO tokens. How how did you decide this? Uh, like who um, like how the uh, all the decision making was was made like to for this merger? Uh, right. So the ultimate decision making was really in the DAO. So there was a proposal that you can see today also at Notice DAO. Like how do we structure this merge? What are the implications? And then every GNO token holder had to vote. I mean, everyone was eligible to vote, but everyone voted. But we had a pretty good turnout at, at this vote, I think. And uh, same also for the stake token holders, even though stake actually was not a DAO at the time, they still let everyone vote. And uh, of course, the concrete proposal of what is the rate and what is, what is connected to this merge, that is something that we discussed previously with the core teams. So it's nothing surprising uh, popping up, but of course, it very much depends on the collaboration of the teams. And so that was something that was previously discussed uh, over a couple of months, actually, of how this could probably look like. Uh, how, how long did it take, actually, for you to decide that that it's... Uh... I think about six months. Six months. Yeah, there were a couple of, like I would say, uh, I was the more pessimistic about this merge initially, uh, simply because for me, operating a network is not only about technical capabilities, but also a lot of business development to actually get adoption of the network. And uh, both teams, like we are very technical and the Excel team is also very technical, maybe even more than us. So the business component was for me clearly missing, uh, but we were able to get a team involved, um, which had a very strong business focus. And so they were actually very important third parties component, which was not part of the official <laughs> kind of merge deal, obviously, but that made it much more viable, a much more viable option. So you attracted the search party for that component? Exactly, yes. Yeah. And just a little bit back about the ICO. I mean, like that was one of the first ICOs, like, uh, right, that was done. So how was it like uh, difficult? Because I've really been challenges. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, most challenges were actually more on the legal side. So okay. that's also what, what kind of delayed everything. So I think we would have done the ICO probably a year earlier um, if we would have not cared about legal. <laughs> uh, but we cared a lot about legal and we tried to have really like super solid setup. And uh, we even got a no action letter by the uh, Gibraltar government at the time that we are able and allowed to do this ICO in their country. And uh, meanwhile, waiting for all these approvals, we also came up with new mechanisms of how to conduct the ICO. So there were many different ways of how you can possibly sell a token, right? And uh, we came up with a system called Dutch auction. I mean, the Dutch auction is just a type of auction where 
it's called Dutch because that's how they yeah. were selling tulips, I think. Like you start at a very high price, and the price goes down over time. Um, and so we applied this also for noses. And uh, well, at the time we created so, or like there was so much FOMO um, that eventually the Dutch auction ended after I think a couple of minutes time. So basically it closed at the highest possible price. Uh, and this was, of course, for us a great outcome. So we were able to raise a lot of funds in return for very little percentage of the total token. Um, and this funding, so we raised an Ether. Um, at the time, Ether was trading at $50. We raised $12.5 million uh, worth of Ether. And we were very bullish on the ecosystem. So we kind of saw the success of Nosus being strongly connected to the success of Ethereum itself. And that's why um, we actually kept everything in Ether. That was, of course, quite advantageous. <laughs> oh, very interesting. And uh, what about today? So how many people are you right now? Actually, I don't know. <laughs> you don't Sometimes know. I meet uh, employees of ours that I, I actually don't know the employees of Gnosis. <laughs> oh my God. Hello. <laughs> I, approximate number would say I would say in the, let's say a little bit bigger Gnosis ecosystem, we are maybe like 150 people. A very cool. <laughs> well, I that's how you know it's pretty decentralized at this point. So I, I'm pretty sure I know like a lot of people not who are actually working for Gnosis to some extent. Yeah. yeah okay. That's, uh, that's very interesting. And uh, how is the team right now like a structured? So what is like, like what is Gnosis today? So how is it like in terms of like company? Like um, how is it structured? How is it like, I know there is like DAO, I mean, not a company, right. like organization, I would say, right? Like there is DAO, how, how is it like structured? How is the, the teams works together? So yeah, so we were at the time when the spin-offs happened, also Gnosis transitioned more into Gnosis DAO. So a lot of the assets proves they held by a company were transferred to the DAO itself. Um, and also with the spin-offs, a lot of people left the Gnosis Limited company. And actually for me personally, it was also important that we don't grow again to like this large size comp organization we were before, which is difficult to manage, but rather have smaller teams that can jointly work together to like one common goal that is defined by Gnosis DAO. And that's how we structured it. So the first task of Gnosis DAO is to onboard core teams and that they're all jointly working together to make those DAO successful, but they act at, with a high degree of independence. Um, and yeah, but now we have about five, six teams. Um, they all got larger grants by Gnosis DAO to work on those DAO related topics. Uh, some of them are very technical. So for example, the Nethermind team is a client team. Um, they're working on building the number one uh, Gnosis chain client. They got a grant, the Aragon team as well. Um, then we have like an infrastructure operator also got a grant. And then of course we have on the BD side, the team that I mentioned before, the business development arm, they got a sizable uh, investment as well. And then um, we also have a treasury management unit. And so there's a couple of, um, of different independent organizations. Gnosis Limited itself, of course, is also still involved, but we are really much, very much focused on on the absolute core development kind of core, I would say rather trying to coordinate between some of those units. Um, but of course, a lot of it is also directly done via Gnosis DAO. So there's a forum where anyone can make proposals and then uh, everyone with Gino Tobits can vote on those proposals. And, uh, but yeah, we try to kind of keep the number of proposals rather low um, to, because it requires a lot of attention. And uh, so there's few proposals to onboard those core units or like get strategic partners involved. Um, but for everything else, we try to not bother Gino token holders too much. Uh, so it's really more like strategic decisions that we try to, um, to actually do via the DAO. Uh, are you still involved in research? Uh, a lot, like as part of, of building Gnosis chain, we also do a lot of research. So especially in the fields that we were also involved in before, like account abstraction, but also uh, the topic of MEV. So um, how can we kind of generally, how can we build a better, um, credibly neutral environment for everyone to operate, for dev developers, but also the users. And uh, so for us, the reason why we started working on Ethereum is because we truly also believe in the values of Ethereum, building better decentralized uh, technology. And that obviously, is still an uphill battle. Like if you look at the networks today, 
hardly any of them are actually decentralized. And uh, if it's not decentralized, then it kind of defeats the purpose for me to be even on blockchain in the first place. And so we, lost, we invest a lot in research of how to make systems more resilient, more decentralized, more scalable. Uh, do you work together with the, with the Serium team on that? Yes, actually, I think Gnosis is a company with the biggest overlap in core development with Ethereum because we work on this exactly same stack. So there's no other network that runs on exactly the same stack. There are a lot of networks which are adopting the EVM, right? Pretty much everyone does because there's a strong network effect around the EVM. But in terms of running actually like the Ethereum software, there's only Gnosis being the yeah, only other like large scale network that actually runs on the same stack. So we have our own beacon chain. As well, also we had to do this merge that you mentioned before. Um, so, and that is the only technology that allows really a high degree of decentralization. So if you look at Ethereum right now has about 500,000 validators that are run by, I think 10 or 11,000 node operators. And, uh, that doesn't come like no other network can compete on this level. Like Solana has maybe a thousand validators, but run maybe by 10 entities, uh, by in smart chain is de facto one entity running everything. So, uh, Polygon is also, I guess, I couldn't even dare to say, but uh, it's definitely a lot less decentralized compared to Ethereum. And because we run on the same technology, we can also have a high degree of validators, right? We have on North Chain today, we have about 120,000 validators, um, which are run by over 1,500 different uh, node operators. And yeah, that's pretty amazing. So there's no other network uh, that can get to this level. That's why I'm quite confident to say, okay, Nose is actually already the third most decentralized network. Yeah, I think you kind of like already answer it to my other question that is uh, regarding how uniquely you positioned actually on the market. But can you tell a little bit more from the point of maybe uh, projects or like developers who wants to build or like ordinary even people like how like what is like unique about Gnosis? Right. So I think there's, of course, there are many different types of developers. Um, so what Gnosis, so basically every, every blockchain has to make trade-offs. This is Trilemma that I think was coined by Vitalik. So you have, can be centralized, you can be, uh, have security and you have, can have scalability and you can never have all three of them. You always have to make compromises and pretty much all the other networks, the Ethereum killers <laughs> or, um, yeah, they, they kind of focus very much on scalability because they, have, they saw that Ethereum falls short. And uh, so they kind of disregarded security and decentralization. That's why they have so little validators and their system are designed in a way that they cannot even have more validators. <laughs> um, and so we are very much focused on scalability. So for Gnosis, we are more like Ethereum. You can think of, of Gnosis kind of replicating what Ethereum does. Um, because we see there's high demand for Ethereum, right? Today, if you look at what blockchains are actually fully utilized, there are very few. Actually, I think there are only two. <laughs> so there's only two networks that actually would need scalability today, which is Ethereum and, and Polygon maybe. Uh, every other network is not fully utilized. So utilization meaning there's still block space left in every block for more computation. So it's not running at capacity. That's why in our view, focusing on scalability is actually the wrong thing. Like it doesn't make sense to offer more that's not even demanded right now. You first have to create more demand before you can invest more in scalability. And that's why uh, we invest a lot in decentralization because ultimately we think if you want to build large scale uh, organizations and operations, then it's very important that as a developer and as a user, you have high degree of guarantees that your applications will be available at any time, right? You're not at the mercy of 10 entities to eventually kick you off the network. <laughs> and that's the reality in most of the other networks um, that, yeah, other than Ethereum and Bitcoin. And so I would say uh, if you want to build something that should be, yeah, be able to, to operate long term, that has a long time horizon, then Gnosis Chain is and you also care about transaction fees, which are much lower on Osis chain compared to Ethereum. It's like a fraction of a cent. Um, then you should consider building on Osis chain. That is of course not the case for every developer. If you build like your NFT game, then maybe the time horizon in which you want to make a success is maybe <laughs> like a slightly shorter time span. 
Uh, but even then, I would say it's interesting to build a Nosis chain because ultimately we also offer the same benefits as others in terms of cheap transaction costs. But in addition, we have a lot of expertise in account abstraction, which became also recently a hot topic. So for us, uh, the SAFE is a solution to account abstraction. It allows you to, to benefit from all, like all the benefits that account abstract abstraction brings in terms of user onboarding and in terms of um, account security, uh, in terms of automation, in terms of uh, transaction batching. So all those benefits are already there. And uh, of course, given our close proximity to the SAFE team and every related entity to the SAFE, uh, we make sure that on, on those chain you have the best experience as a dev developer to take advantage of all those features. Okay, so it's um, yeah, it's uh, actually very great. And what about like um, what is Gnosis like would be the best for developers to build? Like, could you like maybe I know that you have also infrastructure, you have DAOs, you have NFTs, right. you have uh, like different kind of uh, projects. But what is like what what would be the best? For a network, I think it's the best to kind of benefit from what is already there, right? Like where, where can you create synergy effects with other existing projects? And uh, I think there are a few now on those chain, which are super interesting. Um, I would say the most prominent that probably everyone has been using before is POAP, yeah. proof of attendance protocol. I think there are a lot of cool things you can build around this. Um, and then of course, it would be great to actually build a those chain to directly integrate to this protocol. Um, then we have uh, like a stronger focus on real world assets. So uh, recently a new stablecoin onboarded to the NOS chain called Monerium, Euro E. And uh, it's quite fascinating how it works because it's tightly integrated into the SEPA system. So you can do a regular bank transfer from your regular bank account in Europe, um, send it to a new IBAN, which has been generated for you. And immediately Euro tokens will be issued on NOS chain on your account. Um, so it's like the cheapest way basically to go from Euro to on-chain Euro. It's cheaper than any centralized exchange, it's faster than any centralized exchange, and it's programmable. <laughs> so that's great. And the great thing is also it works vice versa. So you can offboard easily from Gnosis chain to regular Euro. So you can trigger a regular bank transfer with a transaction on-chain. And uh, with this kind of innovation, like the line really blurs and like what's happening in the regular fiat world versus what's happening on chain uh, and uh, effectively you have a bank account now on chain and uh, that offers like a real bank account that you can use for anything you use a normal bank account for and there's still a lot to be built uh, in order to take advantage of this um, we also have other like real world asset projects like uh, back finance which are issuing uh, stocks etfs and and uh, and fixed income products on chain which are one-to-one -one backed. And um, yeah, I think those new types of asset classes on chain available, uh, they offer a lot of new possibilities. Uh, I think DAOs for treasury management, they need a lot of, in my view, a lot more diversification into, into other assets. So we, we don't want to have a super strong correlation with the crypto market at all times. And, and those I think offer like a very easy and, and, and safe way to kind of diversify and so far, I would say we're still like lacking tools. So uh, it would be great to welcome developers who are actually taking advantage of those new assets. I think they can be very successful in all this chain. Yeah. And in general, in Web3, what do you think is uh, like, what is like the most coolest to build right now? I would say still the DAOs are at the beginning. So um, we see a lot of DAOs emerging and we also see there are more real world interactions. And I think that's something that will happen much more frequently now. So I think something that clearly worked on Ethereum is capital formation, right? We saw it with ICOs, but we also saw it with DAOs. There was this DAO that tried to buy this constitution, for example, right? Um, and yeah, I think we'll see a lot more of those popping up where like DAOs on chain are used to yeah, to not only do fundraising for one specific purpose, but also generally more align and interests. And I think we will have much more developments in this area where you can much faster iterate of like, how do you come to consensus within a larger group to more effectively drive decisions. And uh, yeah, I, I would expect that we see much more concrete examples also in the future in terms of how this is used specifically in political, I think, agendas to faster align and uh, yeah, allocate resources. So I think that's a, that will be definitely a hot topic.
And you provide, uh, do you provide some tooling as well for, for building DAOs? Yes, we do actually. Yeah. So obviously the safe in itself is kind of the foundation of many DAOs. So probably the number one tool. And so we try to extend the safe with all kind of functionality that allows to better utilize for DAOs. We have even our own framework called Zodiac, um, which allows, for example, uh, on-chain enforceability of decisions that have been done by a DAO, um, has tooling for treasury management, so all kind of things. Um, one organization also very closely affiliated with Gnosis is Kapatki. Mm -hmm. Kapatki is a treasury management unit. They started, they actually kind of, they're not really a spin-off of Gnosis, but uh, like the founder used to work at Gnosis and then he started like uh, managing the treasury of Gnosis DAO, then became its own team. Uh, and now they're not only managing Gnosis DAO, but also ENS DAO, Balancer DAO, and a few others. So it's already a pretty large organization and they do everything around safe contracts. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the synergy here. We have uh, a safe. We have Zodiac as a framework and Zodiac works closely together with Kapatki to uh, really streamline the use case of, of treasury management. So hopefully uh, this will help many other DAOs as well in order to, to more effectively do those operations. Yeah. So if I'm a project that wants to launch as a DAO, right? Yeah. Where should I go? Like, for example, I, I want to I wanna go with you. So what, what should I do like, at the first? Like, what steps? Good question. So um, I would highly encourage to also directly get in contact with us. So we have the forum, we have Discord, and we have like a Telegram group for, for everyone who operates on Gnosis Chain. And for Zodiac, we also have our own Discord uh, to directly guide DAO builders in terms of how they can take advantage of what we have been building. And yeah, I would say those are probably the best channels to get directly in touch with us. And uh, do you actually provide any kind of support in terms of like governance? Because, well, you have a lot of experience with Gnosis now. Do you? Um, so what many projects try to do is receive, for example, grants funding or eventually investment funding. Um, yes. This is now covered by Gnosis Builders. So Gnosis Builders is another core unit of Gnosis that tries to directly support builders on Gnosis chain. Um, and so they have a grants program that you can easily apply via a form. Uh, what are the grants? Uh, you... So it really, so generally as a rule of thumb, like we support open source public goods projects with grants on Gnosis chain. So if you build something where you don't have to inten intention to launch a token anytime soon. Uh, that we are, and it's something where we clearly see a benefit for people on Gnosis Chain, then we're happy to support it. Um, if you actually have the intention to make it commercial, then we can also talk because we also have an investment arm which also can invest into projects. So that would be the other direction. Uh, in any case, happy to talk. Yeah. And uh, regarding the, DAO, the Gnosis DAO, so how is it like really the decision making is done? How is the community is engaged? I mean, like once you go to your website, there is like community run chain. Right. This is like your main, I guess, right now goal, right? To make this like the most right. centralization, right? As I saw from your previous talks as well, that you talk a lot about that. So tell a little bit more about details, like how is it like run? What kind of lessons maybe we can learn from you? Yeah, yeah. so uh, in terms of community run chain, we mean it quite literally. So. Um, we want a lot of individuals to run nodes at home um, to participate in validating Gnosis chain. And a lot of them do this already. So we, again, we have about 1,500 nodes operating, uh, out of which a majority, I think, is run by individuals at home or somewhere. <laughs> uh, and that sense is a community run chain. Um, it's not a, a chain run by very few staking providers. <laughs> Uh, and that's very important to us because then it becomes super resilient, right? Like if you, it's, it's really difficult to actually take those chain down, like it will not be easily possible. Um, and in terms of governance, I would say there's still also a lot to, that, a lot that we have to learn ourselves, to be honest. Like, uh, I think we, um, it is always, or it has been always a challenge and for all DAOs today, even, I think there's not a single DAO where you have more than 10% of the token holders or like token actually being used for voting, probably less, a lot less than 10% of the token holders actually vote, <laughs> probably more like 2%. So that's generally the problem of 
like how do you uh yeah how do you get the how do you get the attention of token holders to vote <laughs> yeah um and so far the only system we have is yeah you can delegate your vote to someone else and this person hopefully votes but most of them also don't and to be honest we haven't solved this problem yet mm -hmm. so um for notice DAO, it's pretty similar voter turnout as for other DAOs. and i think the problem is um that you don't have like uh, let's say token holders that are large token holders are usually also large token holders somewhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's very few, like for you yourself, in order to really participate in voting uh, and really care about the underlines of the DAO, your personal stake into in this project has to be significant for your overall net worth, right? If I have 1% here, 1% there, then ultimately I will probably not care about any of them enough to really get engaged. And uh, generally, I would say there are very few where you reach a threshold where people actually really care. And uh, so on the other hand, you have a lot of people who care but don't have tokens. <laughs> and so I, I think that's something you have to balance better. And um, yeah, I mean, many DAOs try to have this delegation process where, uh, like you said, like you promote delegates always like politicians mm -hmm. and they will uh, receive like... Um, yeah, token, like they can vote with tokens on behalf of others. Uh, that's something that in general Gnosis DAO also supports, but we never had this process of kind of fostering this politics with the Gnosis DAO. Um, that's something we, I think, should do or we should evaluate, like how do we do this best? Um, but I would say generally it's still like an open discussion. Like the, I would say the problem is most people buy tokens, not because they want to get involved in governance, right? They only buy tokens because they honestly, they hope that there will be potentially an upside in buying his token and holding the token, eventually selling the token. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know, like this, this <laughs> I don't have a key answer to this, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but there is already some some practices, as you mentioned, right? So yeah. uh, that's very interesting to learn because I guess uh, we will see much more of uh, DAOs in the future because the, the regulation becomes more and more favorable, right, regarding right. that. So but where do you see like DAO is uh, more appropriate? Like what kind of like uh, use cases you would say like yeah. That is, would be also like considering that people would be involved in that kind of decisions. Yeah, it's also a good question. So I think someone promoted, I think Jesse Walden uh, promoted this concept of progressive decentralization. And I think that's also very important for every, uh, yeah, for every entrepreneur. Um, it's very important to first be able to really uh, show product market fit to really like set things up for success before you even consider decentralizing anything. Because <laughs> uh, as soon as you do this, then it's really difficult to revert back to something. When you see things go wrong, then the DAO is not going to fix it for you. It's not like it's very unlikely that the DAO will be able to to align fast enough to in order to implement important changes. Um, so I would say that's very important. So I would say don't decentralize too early but only at a very late stage. And I think there's, like, you can do steps, right? Like you don't have to kind of fully give up control. Um, you can have like a council or whatever, like a board in the company <coughs> that can, can drive decisions. And uh, depending on what stage you are, you should consider the next step in this decentralization path. Um, but in my view right now, there are very few organizations which I would consider like really truly decentralized <laughs> and functional and uh yeah i i think there's maybe the only one i would say uh, is probably or like the only two is probably ethereum and bitcoin so ethereum right now does not depend on vitanic it does not depend on the ethereum foundation if the ethereum foundation would disappear tomorrow ethereum would continue operating there are enough entities having vested interest in ethereum to continue operated um but I would say this is not really the case yet for any of the projects running on top. Um, or maybe there's a few which would also uh, still be maintained. Um, but for most, it's still, I would say, they're still on the path towards decentralization. It's not fully decentralized yet. 
Uh, well, as an investor, you know, like I receive lots of uh, lots of projects, and sometimes I receive exactly those that uh, yeah, we will just launch like very soon DAO, and we will be DAO. So tell maybe some examples of this like biggest this, like mess up. <laughs> Do you know some stories? You don't need to know. Yeah, I would like, say, of course, it's also used as a, many cases for legal defensibility. So I will not name anyone, but I think you can probably think for yourself, like if the founders would disappear or the core team behind it, would anyone jump in and be able to fix it? And in my view, if you cannot answer this clearly with yes, then it's not decentralized. And for me, if you, you could imply this almost to every team working on Ethereum right now, if the core team leaves, then it's unlikely someone else will pick up the slack and finish it. So yeah, <laughs> I would say <laughs> right, there would be many, I would say it's also fine, obviously it's, it's a journey and also for Ethereum, it took a long time to get to the stage, I would say. And it's also, I would say many of the projects are also too founder driven or too much associated to one or two people. And it's also, of course, a challenge you have to really purposefully kind of step back and let others take over. Um, Vitalik also is trying to do this, of course, I would say generally how people think, like they always like to associate projects with very few people because it's just easier to understand and easier to follow. In reality, uh, that's also what kind of then still drives to the centralization, I think. But yeah, I think it's quite kind of the task of the founder as well then to eventually really disappear into the background. And I think that was also maybe one of the reasons why obviously Satoshi did this as kind of first principle. No one knows me, I'm not here. And I think that's also why Bitcoin could become so successful because there was not this one point of, uh, let's say, centralization around uh, one person. Um, and I think Vitalik tries to do the same. So he tries also to be a lot less involved. I think the public perception is that he is much more involved than he actually is. Uh, so sometimes I still get people to walk towards me and ask me like, yeah, but Vitalik is actually the decision maker, isn't he? And no, that's not the case. How do you think DAO will change in the future? Obviously we are, we'll be facing more adoption, right? And, and blockchain space. What is your vision of the future for DAO? Like in general, like of, as, as a concept? Yeah, I, uh, well, I think independent of blockchain, it's pretty clear that the way how we make decisions is, is maybe not the best way, no matter where you are on this planet. I, I think governments in general have shown to be not the most or like no matter how it's implemented, uh, it doesn't seem to be um, working great everywhere. And so I, I see high level, uh, big potential in utilizing information more effectively to come to better decisions for governance, not only within blockchain applications, but also outside of blockchain applications. And hopefully it allows us to, uh, yeah, to iterate faster on how governance actually works, because obviously like changing the constitution of a, of a country in order to change how we come to decision making. That's maybe a 50 years project or whatever. Uh, on blockchain, you can change a smart contract and have social consensus of how, how things should be done. And you can iterate very quickly. So I would say there's at least the potential to, to come to better decision making mechanisms that we can prove over time uh, using blockchain technology and then eventually start using it for other like smaller projects within society. I don't know, like more local communities can start using it. And then eventually it can propagate to yeah, even bigger decision making. Um, um, yeah, maybe in Switzerland, I don't know, places where direct democracy is more in place, maybe more suited for this. Uh, but yeah, I would say in a very really large time horizon, eventually this can propagate even to this level. What about Gnosis DAO? So what would you see like for, uh, for, for the future for Gnosis DAO? Like what the main challenges that you are focusing on right now? Yeah, I would say high level, um, kind of getting where Ethereum is today in terms of being actually decentralized and, uh, like we already trying to, trying to get there by having all these different core teams working together. Um, but of course it has to be way, way bigger than this in order to be really fully decentralized. And, um, yeah, I think that's kind of the high level goal. So finding a, a path where, where we can retire without the system <laughs> not being, uh, 
<laughs> not being, let's say, at uh, high capacity functioning. So your biggest dream is to retire right now. <laughs> at least, at at least founder. <laughs> not fearing that if you do this, it will have eventually consequences on the network. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So what is the, what are the founders are dreaming about? This is interesting. <laughs> so, and of course I will never retire, but there has to be a part where, uh, at least it's clear that, um, things can all move on. And of course, if nothing would happen, if I would actually kind of not be, be there right now. Uh, but I would still see potential impacts, which should not be there. So, um, and again, ultimately it's, it's not, I'm not only talking about myself here, but kind of the core team, the core teams driving it right now. Uh, if you want to be really, um, yeah, really long-term decentralized and it's also about how do you, how do you create real sustainability, right? Like how, how do you how are you able to fund actually all those different initiatives that are needed to make it operational. And that's a, a long way to go for all projects in the space, to be honest. About uh, other cases. So what, what would you say like a lot worse? What's yeah, I would say, um, there are a lot of like real world, um, problems that like, for example, um, kind of what also original vision of Ethereum was like, how do we make financial services more accessible to everyone? And that's a major issue in most countries, actually. Like, how do you actually get a bank account, <laughs> right? Like, how do you how do you create like an inclusive system? And those problems are hard to solve. Um, at this point, I would say the number one blocker is not technology. It's on the other side, more um, creating better user experience and also uh, talking to regulators to make those actually viable options. And yeah, if you are able to contribute to, to any of those problems, then I think you will be successful. Cool. Well, thank you so much. It was a very big pleasure uh, to have a talk with you. And uh, yeah, so see you soon, right? Thanks for having me.